and we're recording so you can begin. Okay. Um, okay. I keep forgetting, do I call the call the roll to make sure that we're here or do I do the pursuant to chapter 21st? Um, you can do the pursuant to chapter 20 and call the meeting to order and um, then confirm that members can hear and okay. be heard. Very good. Okay, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so, do so via Zoom or by telephone. See instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every, um, the, the word, I don't know what it's supposed to be. It says every director, um, maybe effort perhaps, will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time uh, via technological means. Okay, I call the meeting to order and it is at 632. And I'm going to check that people can um, hear and be heard. Uh, Shalini Ball Milne. Here. Okay, and Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. Andrew Steinberg. Present. And we're, okay, and Anika is not here yet. Um, Okay, so I don't believe out. she's going to make it tonight. She emailed to say that she was ill. Okay, very good. So then Nika will be absent. Okay, and can I recognize um, our guests, um, uh, Jennifer LaFountain, Paul Bachelman, and Guilford Mooring. I cannot tell what that picture is, but it looks very interesting. And Amy Rusecki. So um, I think we're going to open with public comment on water and sewer. Um, that's what we decided at the last meeting, I believe. So um, do we have anybody, um, got two per attendees I see. Um, okay, um, does anybody in the, who's an attendee want to make public comment at this time? Okay, well, we'll be having another chance for public comment later in the meeting. Okay, um, the first, item on the agenda is the proposed amendment to recommendation on parking regulations on North Pleasant Street between Triangle and Halleck Street. Uh, and this comes out of CRC. And it's moved to amend the, the motion to add the phrase dual use on both in bullet points three and four after parking spaces four and before permit parking and add the phrase and metered parking at 50 cents an hour for two hour parking limit enforced Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the end of bullet three and bullet point four. Um, so um, there was an explanation with this and um, I believe in short, it was a way of making the permit par uh, parking spaces more um, versatile and that when the permit time is up, which is um, I believe at f um, 6 p.m., right? Five. Five, then why is it say, well, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna question. Um, when the permit time is up, that it be noted that it is available yes. for metered parking. So, um, and that there would be a two hour parking limit enforced Monday through Saturday uh, from 8 a.m. to 5, 6 p.m. Um, so it's essentially our motion, but it took um, um, an area that we didn't look into. And I, it seems, um, reasonable to me. So let me take any questions or comments on this. Yes, Paul. So, um, you know, this is, um, there are a couple concerns in this. And one is that um, we are eliminating a lot of permit parking spaces in this area. This is, and Jen can speak to this as well. And you have just raised the permit parking fee. So we're increasing the fee and minimize and eliminating spaces. So just be alert to that fact. And the other is that some, so there, we have, I think just one area of town, Jen, that we have this already, which is Spring Street, where you can have permit parking or metered parking. And it does create some confusion with users because they it's dual signs and they're trying to figure out what is appropriate here and mm -hmm. there's different timing you know the five o'clock and six o'clock is by regulation do you want to address that jen at all right and also um with the dual use um the portion of spring street that's dual use there's a lot of confusion on saturdays where um it in normal 
designated permit areas, anyone can park there and not be ticketed. So people will park there and not pay the meter and expect not to get ticketed as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the dual use can be really confusing for many reasons. But okay. we do we do have it on Spring Street now, and it's you know it it does it generates some ticketing that people don't like. So just be prepared mm -hmm. that that's just an alert for that. Right, um, Andy. I was curious. Uh, do we have, has anyone talked to anybody from CRC to understand why they made this recommendation? Because I think Jennifer is. Uh, in the sort of stated what I was concerned about and hearing about it that I frankly couldn't understand how it worked and if I can't figure out how it's going to work I'm not sure how people who haven't thought about how the parking regulations so it'd be such a convoluted signage and explanation that would be required mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that it's necessary because um uh, which is why I want to know if what CRC's purpose was, what they were trying to uh, get from this. Um, I've raised my hand. I read the memo that went with it. Uh, there was concern that um, permit parkers, once the weekly time is up and it's not enforced, could leave their car there the whole weekend. And that would then be uh, preventing people coming to the park with children from parking their cars. Um, and uh, Shalini, did you want to add to that? Yeah, that's the discussion I remember was that <clears throat> this area was uh, because the young kids coming there and older people bringing grandkids. And so it was to make it accessible to them. That's all I remember about that. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question, which was in the was when was this to take part? Because I know the eventual plan after the road widening or whatever, there's going to be parking kiosks. Um, are there, would there be able to be meters at this point? Um, because a, a meter, a, a sign that says permit parking and with a meter next to it, if you read the sign, you can figure out what it is. Um, it's a little harder, I think, if the kiosk is further away. I don't know if that was discussed in CRC. Shalini or what Guilford has to say about that. So, I mean, how, how we, you, you set the regulations, we, we do the uh, implementation and enforcement and we're moving away from individual meters. They're expensive and hard to maintain. So we're moving more to the kiosk model as we move forward. Right, yes, and, and that does make sense. Um, well, I had a thought, I mean, I do understand that this is complex. Um, but I think if there were a special article or articles or even something on the town website about the park, parking at the park, okay, that this could be explained because it is a little complicated. Um, but it could be explained and those who want to park at the park to take children there would pay attention to it. Um, so it could be, you know, a targeted um, information newspaper article and something on the website that would explain it because it is kind of complicated, but I, I think the goal of the thing that CRC was trying to do is a worthy goal. Um, Dorothy, I, want, I wanted to clarify that, that, that this was an amendment proposed by one councilor, not by the committee, yeah, okay. not by the CRC committee. So it's not coming from CRC. It's just okay, so one it's, councilor it's, who had right. planned to take it off consent at the last council meeting when it was on the agenda and proposed this motion. Okay. So uh, they wanted to give the, TSO an opportunity okay. to to weigh in on that proposal before it came back to the council on Monday. Right, I, I wondered about that. It's confusing because it was the chair of the committee, so I didn't know if it was officially from one or the other. But so far, it's only from one only councilor on CRC. Okay, um, okay, um, Guilford. Thank you. When we, when we first started looking at the kiosk. Um, there was actually a method for people who have special events or so forth to put in special numbers to pay for parking. So let us look at the kiosk again and talk to the vendor again and, and make sure that's possible to, to put those um, special events. So if you have the ability to put in a, a meter 
I mean, a, a downtown parking permit number in it and it accepts it and we can let it accept it, that would actually help you with this situation. We have individual meters on Spring Street, so you can't, <clears throat> you can't do that unless we take the individual meters out and put a kiosk in. But when we were first looking at the kiosk, there was um, all sorts of little things that you could do to, um, to encourage people to park there and not um, have special event parking, basically. So if you consider the permit parking, special event parking, we may be able to get around, around the issue of, of permit parker. They have to go up to the kiosk, they have to put their number in and it tells them, yes, it works, no, it doesn't. So there might be a possibility to do something to make this a little easier. That sounds very interesting. I'm, my brain has not totally wrapped itself around the concept. Does anyone else need a little more explanation on how the kiosk could work? Okay, so I guess it's clear. Um, no, but you, you needing more information is, is a good enough reason for us to, to get it, Dorothy. I mean, if there's, yeah, we wanna make sure everybody's clear, so. So, okay, if I have a permit, I go to a kiosk and I type a number in, this is if the system can work and Guilford has to double check. And it says, yes, I recognize you, you have a permit and then you can park there. Um, so if then, then the permit hours are over, and a parent is coming to the park with a child and wants to park there. What do they do with the kiosk? I haven't, I haven't used kiosks. Okay. So if you, if you're, if you're just a regular, if you don't have a permit, you just go up to the kiosk and you put your license plate number in and you pay for your time. And that's how all the kiosks work, which is the same as the meter, except the meter doesn't need your license plate. But if it accepts it, it tells you it's okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's that is at least something to erase some of the confusion. You know it's okay because they accepted it. Okay, Andy. Yeah, I guess I still don't understand because uh, if the goal is to increase the number of spaces that are available for people using the park, and I think that is the understood goal, and I support it, then. Um, the question, what we want to do is maximize the use of spaces for meters to the extent possible. And uh, it, it's, you know, that would seem to work, but uh, we would need to have appropriate signage and I would understand the signs, but I'm, I'm really confused about what's being asked. There is the um, reality that when you get to Sundays and holidays, which are popular days to bring your kids to the park because you're not working, you, you know, parents are less likely to be working, mm -hmm. then they aren't gonna be able to necessarily use metered spaces because anybody can park unlimited in the metered space on a weekend anyway. So, I'm not sure that we've attained the purpose anyway of what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. And uh, then, you know, in this whole dual use thing, I have absolutely no understanding still of why it actually is a benefit. Because, uh, you know, somewhat for the same reasons, uh, but it's certainly if, uh, if, if we're going to then say that people who have permits can uh, put their permit number in and use the meter as if it was a permitted space. We've actually decreased the number of spaces that are available for the preferred purpose of, of uh, parents with kids being able to use it at the park. So I, I just, I can't get my head around what we're talking about here. Um, Anna. Oh, Paul can go first because I think he's going to say the same thing as me. But we'll probably say it better. So go ahead, yeah, Paul. I do. don't know if we're going to say the same. So, so I think the purpose of the amendment that the councilor made was to take space, 10 spaces that were reserved for permit parking only and expand it to allow it to be used for metered parking as well. And so that if there's not, a, if, if you don't have a permit, you can use that space if no one's using it any already it, with a permit. So I think that's the intent of the, um, of the, of the amendment. Uh, and so that's why it's called dual use. You can have a permit or you can pay a meter to do it. Is that what you're going to say, Anna? Kind of. I, I was just going to add that it 
Saturdays, you still do have to pay. So it, it yeah. would be that it's not the full weekend um, that you can just park in a metered space. I think the question for me, and I is actually, I want to hear from Jennifer is, are we, if we open these to metered spaces, we're kind of guessing um, that they'll be utilized as metered spaces, but we won't really lose fully 10 permit spots and get complaints about that. Right. So I think that that's where we just want to that's the decision as I see it is, do we feel like we are able to potentially have 10 fewer permit spots if these are constantly being utilized during those hours as metered parking? Um, that's my understanding of the question. I support the dual use because I, I think that it's a, uh, I think more spaces is better, but um, yeah, look at that. Look, that's Athena, so good. Uh, so I, I'd like to hear from Jennifer, kind of her thoughts on if we're, if we're get, playing a dangerous game in losing those spaces, if that's okay, Dorothy. Yes. So I, I want to add one question for Jennifer. I'm assuming that these um, kiosks have timing in them so that if you put it, your permit number in after the, the metered, after the permit time, say in the evening, it will not accept that as payment. Okay, so Jennifer. Um, the entering the permit number into the kiosk is a new feature that I was not aware of. Um, so Guilford could probably answer that a little bit better. Um, my, my concern, and I don't know if this is gonna answer the question, my concern is, are those 10 spaces that are being proposed as dual use what if those 10 spaces are used as metered all the time and now you have no permit spaces at all and we've just increased the permit price tenfold um, for this upcoming season and now we have really a, a whole side of the street unavailable for people with those more expensive parking permits along with another building being built with mixed use that's going to potentially have more people downtown as well. Yeah, that was my that was my concern, Jennifer. Um, thank you. And and can I ask a clarifier, Dorothy? Yes, absolutely. Why are they putting and I apologize if I missed this. I was playing with Microsoft Word for a second trying to get it to cooperate. Why would they have to put their permit number into the kiosk? Don't they get a sticker? Isn't that the whole point? Sorry, I, I'm confused why they would have to do that at all. Uh -huh. I think they do, um, they will continue to get a sticker, but I think if I understood how Guilford explained it was with the dual use, they'd be, um, they'd be able to put their sticker number into the kiosk and it would recognize that, that they have, um, that they've technically paid to park there. So they wouldn't have to pay again with their um, license plate number. But they wouldn't have to pay again anyway, because they have the sticker that would tell the person going around giving tickets that they have a permit so they shouldn't get ticketed. Great. Right. The kiosk so, really in my mind only applies to people who are, the kiosk is a meter. So it, it only applies to people who are utilizing metered parking, right? right. The kiosk is just a singular large meter. Right, right. Okay, right. So, thank so you. The, I thought for a second I was losing my mind. I appreciate it. No, no. So the, the question for Guilford is this amendment assumes that the kiosk can do different things at different times. There is no intent in this amendment as I read it to take away any permit time according to the permit regulations. But for the time that is not as a, that belonging solely to the permit holder um, or any permit holder was to put the metered parking for that thing. Can the kiosks do that? Dorothy, I think you might be getting hung up on the kiosks and I, I don't think that's the, the, um, top, well, the look, she, Jennifer worried that this would take away the par par parking permits. And the way I read this, the intention was never to take away any permit parking under the, so the limits, the rules of the permit parking. But if it turns out that that is too difficult to do, then, then we have to know about that. No, isn't it the question, isn't the question that uh, we wouldn't have enough spaces available for people who are paying a higher fee for the permits and so that um, we'd get complaints from permit holders who are finding that they can't find a place to park? That's my understanding, Andy. 
Good clarification. Yep. Okay, Shalini, please speak. So I think the increase in the rates, we shouldn't be apologetic because it was extremely low and it's still lower than our neighbors than what buildings are charging than what UMass is charging. So we're just making it slightly more realistic mm -hmm. and we shouldn't feel apologetic. My question is more around what is the time? Uh, I had heard that the parking and I'm maybe Andy, you know that when the select board was discussing the build the buildings that are coming up and the parking that my understanding was that it's not downtown's responsibility to provide parking to the buildings and mm -hmm. and i feel like our responsibility is to everyone who's utilizing downtown and and of course i mean the fact that we don't have enough parking means that we should have a parking which should be sponsored by the the downtown builders through the bid and build that parking so this centralized parking for a lot to to uh, to take care of that problem but here we're taking away parking from our residents who come to downtown with kids in favor of the the permit parking people and i don't know that's my understanding but and, and also i wasn't able to find any of this anywhere so i'm a little lost also about i'm just reading all this now like i, I didn't find it in the town the where this document that we're discussing right now where it was i couldn't find it in the town the sharepoint or here or so i'm sorry if i'm not making any sense because i'm kind of speaking mm -hmm. on um, yeah i it's in a report of the tso committee before the changes and when i su submitted the agenda i submitted this but i believe it was abbreviated but i'm not sure it's yeah. very confusing right now yeah yeah it did get it, it did get abbreviated but we did have you know when we, when in the the report it has the motion and what we voted on and uh, which is this without the yellow changes um anna so i want to i want to i'm going to try to offer some clarification um cuz cuz i think it can be confusing when i so Shalini, this is not taking away parking from metered spots. What we had initially done was that these were only for permitting. And so Mandy's proposed amendment is actually adding more parking for metered. Um, so just to be clear, like if that is the goal, like if that is your, your belief that we should have as much metered parking as possible, then vote for this amendment. Um, if you are concerned that we do not have enough parking for permit holders, you might consider not voting for this amendment. Um, I think that, that's my opinion on where the kind of two sides of it are. So I think that the, to your earlier point though, about, about parking, we made the decision to not require a certain amount of onsite. We, the council prior to my time, um, I'm not like removing myself from fault there, but uh, made the decision not to require a, a specific amount of on-premise parking for buildings that go in. So there is a, responsibility for the town because we offer the permits to folks who live within a certain radius of the streets that we all just we just approved that right so like i think that responsibility is a big word but um that's kind of we just did that when we went through the streets that get access to permits i can't remember specifically what streets are on it and it might be helpful to look at a map but um i think that that's for me this question at hand is do we think that we have enough permit parking that we can risk losing 10 spots for the benefit of having 10 additional metered spots or not? That's my, that's my short way of explaining this. But Anna, that is not what this says. It does not mean to take away the metered spots. It says nope. after the meet, after the, not to take away the permit spots. After the permit, they have a certain number of a time frame in which they have that spot. When that time frame is not specifically given to a permit holder, it is saying make that metered. But I see Paul's so, hand so, up. So, to, to, so Dorothy, though, if you read it as it was before, seven back-end parking spaces for permit parking Monday through Friday, 
and then it changed to seven back in spaces for dual use permit parking and metered parking Monday through Friday. Right. But the so dual is, use only in the non-permit allowed hours. No, eight through 5 p.m. It's all of the hours. Is that right, and, Jennifer? Okay, uh, that's, I did not get that. Okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yep, no problem. Okay, it says dual all, all the time. Okay, okay. Uh, Paul. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, if uh, the when Sino was sharing the screen, there was a paragraph at the bottom of it that where the counselor proposing it explained why she was proposing it. And it was a pretty clear explanation of why she thought this was a better idea uh, for, for you to consider that where it says my reason for seeking this amendment. Um, So I think one thing the council could do or that you could recommend is to accept this uh, amendment um, and it, and we can see how it works. You can always change it, you know, down the road if you um, if you find that, you know, there are some enforcement issues that will prop that'll pop up, but we can, you know, we work through that now on Spring Street. Um, and we will you we will guarantee to get people we will have to just alert people when they buy parking permits that there are very few parking permit spaces available in the town. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, what was I going to say? I had a, I had a really good point that just flew out of my head. Um, okay. All right. So um, I'm going to take my hand down until I can remember what it was. Um, anyone with another question or comment? Okay, Andy. So Paul, are you recommending that uh, we, we do this? I guess is one question. And the other is, um, has anybody actually tried to, at least on paper, des design what a sign would look like that would go over these spaces so that people understand what they are? Jen deals with this on a regular basis. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to get the council to, you know, yeah. to a place that where you can take an action. And right. if, if, and I think Anna tried to say, if you want more permit parking, you vote no. If you vote, if you want more metered parking, you vote yes. Okay. Was a good way okay. to describe it. And Jen, do you want to weigh in on any of this? I think the, the dual use on Spring Street is a little less confusing because there is indiv individual meters for each parking space that makes it a little more obvious that you should be paying for a meter. Um, so I think we'd have to work on some pretty defined signage for, for um, North Pleasant Street with the kiosk. I don't, I don't know. It'll be tricky down yep. there, I think. I recognize myself, I have my hand up. That it was mentioned, Anna, I said that there are some streets listed for permits. The streets listed for permits are not North Pleasant Street. Streets listed are some of the small surrounding streets to the downtown. Um, um, at least every time I've seen this exact streets listed, there's very few of them. Um, like I think they, we just added Page and Beston, which are very teeny streets, which are very narrow and don't have much parking. And there were streets of that type uh, where parking on the street is difficult. Um, the other thing is, Paul says, give it a try. I believe with kiosks, it's easier to give it a try because you don't have to take meters out of the concrete sidewalk. Um, so that it's a little easier to be, to see how something goes and then to change it when you're using a kiosk system. Andy, is that hand still up? No, I'm sorry. No, okay. All right, I'm going to take mine down too. Okay. Um, so Jen's comment is that she will, it will be tricky to write a sign that will work and that there may be um, an unpleasant learning curve at the beginning when people get ticketed. That's pretty much it, right, Jennifer? I, I think it'll just be hard to 
to start it. And once people understand the process, it always gets a little bit easier. Um, so it's something that we can include. It should it get voted in, um, we can definitely include it in the educational process we give people when they apply for parking permits. And okay. we'll just make sure we make that very clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anna, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just have a process question. Um, Athena, are we moving the motion as was written or is it as was written in the agenda or are we moving to recommend the council make the amendment? You would be making a recommendation to the council about, so, or, or um, revising your earlier recommendation to, to include these changes. Okay, so if I were to make a motion, it would be, I move to revise our earlier motion to um, add the phrase, is that correct? Or would it, which is, which is better? Um, let me see. Um, I, I think you could probably take this to, to revise your recommendation All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a shot at it. Um, I move to revise our recommendation regarding northbound traffic on North Pleasant Street from McClellan to Triangle to add the phrase dual use as both in bullet points three and four after parking spaces four and before permit parking and to add the phrase quote, and metered parking at 50 cents per hour with a two hour parking limit enforced Monday through Saturday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the end of bullet point three and bullet point four. No second. Second, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> Dorothy, we need to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, oh, I have my hand up in oh, again. Oh, okay. So I meant to anyway. We'll I'm sorry. Oh, sorry um, yeah, I, I think I, I'm going to vote no. I don't know where everybody else is. And the reason I'm voting no is because 20 park, 20 spaces that are um, being set aside as metered spaces is actually quite a bit. And, you know, I see a lot of families there, but I can't say that I see that number of um, families there on a regular basis. And there are a lot of other close by metered spaces. We just um, approved the idea of um, a much enhanced crosswalk across from directly in front of the playground to access parking that's available um, in the, the lots that are behind uh, the, the, uh, across, uh, across the way on the other side of uh, East Pleasant Street and make it much safer to cross. So I don't think that we're really making it that difficult for uh, people who are bringing kids to find metered places. Um, so I think that my inclination is, is that uh, this is creating a lot of confusion for something that I think is not really have a, having a demonstrated need. Okay, um, any other comments before we vote? Shalini. I, I think the dual, the advantage is that if it's not being used by families coming down, then it could be used by people who have special permits. So it's not, um, and at the same time, it is putting out a message to the community that we really want you to and have safe ways to park. And we did hear residents, and I'm totally confused at this point whether it was the TS or the CRC, but but we mm -hmm. did hear from residents and seniors who want that easy access to the park. So making it easier for them, I think to me is a bigger priority. And 
uh, so I will be voting yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to call the question now and I'll start with you, Shalini. Yes. Okay, and um, Andy. No. Okay, and Anna. Yes. And Dorothy, yes. And Anika is absent. Uh, I note that she's left me a phone message, but I can't access it during the meeting. So I just want you to know that she has called and tried to, to leave a message, okay? I spoke um, with her, Dorothy, she's ill. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so that is the vote, which is uh, three yes, uh, one no and one absent. Okay. And Andy, time will tell. <laughs> You know, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And as Paul says, we can change our mind. Okay. But Just anyway, a quick we're going to- that, that, that this new motion will be on the motion sheet, but it won't be on consent agenda since it wasn't consent here. It wasn't uh, unanimous here at unanimous. Okay, thank you. And we don't know what will happen on the town council. It will be on motion sheet. Okay, okay so moving on to now to um, Water bylaw and regulations, sewer bylaw and regulations. I happily turn the meeting over to Anna. I've tried to get one bite in. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, okay, so we're going to start with water. Um, and I first want to apologize to Guilford and Amy. This There's just a ran out of hours, y'all ran out of hours. So um, my plan for today is I do have marked up versions. I will send them to you right after this meeting. Um, and I went through and we're going to start with water uh, and we're going to see how far we get. And I went through the comments and um, picked out the ones that felt like meaty discussion topics versus quick questions for you. Uh, and so that's, I'd like to go through if that's okay, those elements. Um, so I will share my screen. Also, hi, welcome. How are you? Yes. Thanks for I being am. here. All right. Okay. So as a reminder, we are we are on water eggs. Um, this document includes comments from. Uh, it says my name a whole lot, but these are comments from myself, Rob Hegner, and Mandy Johanneke. Um, and so the yellow highlights are just for my mental uh, my mental note to to okay. talk about those things. Um, Anna, uh, I can't read any of that. Um, okay. It's small. Hang on one second. I will try to make it bigger. I'm going to try to read the thing on the side while I also make it bigger. So bear with me. All right. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things that's that had come up again and again in the comments is whether it's always new installation only or um, on, or if it applies to everyone retroactively. And so I'm curious if you could speak to, is there any difference, are there any differences in terms of where it is retroactive, if it's ever retroactive, where is it retroactive, or is it only for new, uh, new, new installation? So our, our, our permits apply, our policy applies to all customers. So if you're an existing customer, they apply to you. And if you're a new customer, it applies to you. So... Did that, did that answer the question or? So what happens if someone's not in compliance with this and doesn't know it? Um, we try to bring them in compliance. Uh, otherwise, well, actually most of the time we just try to bring people in compliance and it, and it works out pretty good. Okay. So Although there's a, there are some new things in here, which we'll have to work with people to get them into compliance. Yeah. So, and I think that's, I, I think it's, I think this question arose from some curiosity about how you do that, right? And how we're we're making sure there's a the engagement component to not put people in a place where they have to get fined. Um, sorry, my dog has had two dinners and is still somehow very needy. Uh, so I think that answers it. Anyone else have any questions about application of this? No, okay. So um, one of the big questions that came up for one of our reviewers throughout this was the dispute resolution and due process question. Um, and so when I send this to you, you'll see that question pop up a lot. Um, and I'm curious, you know, this, the, the commenter wrote, there does not seem, there does not appear to be any administrative or dispute resolution process. This would be necessary to ensure customers receive due process for a number of actions that may be taken by the utility. Uh, 
For example, when the regulation allows the utility to fine or otherwise take action against a customer. So could you speak to how you are ensuring due process throughout this? Yeah, Amy. No, I was just going to comment that I think that's one that's come up and that even came up from Paul initially reviewing it. And the only reason that it's not laid out here was because he was trying to figure out whether this being a town regulation, whether it falls into here's how the dispute resolution goes for anybody that's in violation of any regulation or whether there's something specific that we need to lay out here. So we're just trying to get clarification on where it's appropriate to put that. Okay, great. So I can say that's a coming soon feature. Well, it, it could be coming soon, but it may not be coming soon because we operate not only under the authority of the regulations, we also operate under the authority and the requirements of the state law. Mm -hmm. So some of the things may be required by state law and there's no way to appeal them. State law says you'll do them. And if we don't do them, make sure you do it, we're fined and the town will end up being fined as the water purveyor. So I guess we need to kind of, we need to figure those two things out somehow and um, define that for you. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I should have been clear. I meant it will be addressed in that you're going to work on it, not that it's a guaranteed thing for every, yeah. Um, okay. Um, Anna, what page are you on? I, I, I find many Bs, but none with those words next to it. I am on page two. Oh, okay. B A B one A. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I You're thought fine. that was just the use of terms, um, definitions, but it isn't. Okay. No okay. Thank you. Um, does um, anyone else have any questions regarding retroactive or due process? Those two comments before I move on. All right. Continuing on. Um, so. One of the, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm following my own rules. I apologize if I'm making you motion sick by trying to find my next highlight. I really was trying not to go through every single thing. Um, so there was a couple, there were a couple of questions about lawn irrigation systems. And I know I asked this when it first came up at council, um, but it seemed unclear whether uh, folks have like a hose attached to a sprinkler versus like a built in um, and so I just wanted clarification because in my mind, this was a simple edit of like, can you just add something explaining that this is for built like constructed irrigation, but I wanted to confirm that that was true. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Scrolling, scrolling. Sprinkler systems. We're moving on. To... Okay. Sorry. Um, all right, so this part, the, um, nope, hang on. I don't like sharing my screen while I'm scrolling through because it. I know I'm making everyone seasick and I'm up, up very apologize for that. All right, uh, so there were a couple of questions around service. Um, does this, so for those following along at home, I'm on page seven, uh, 5A. Right. Does this prevent a duplex townhome or apartment? Stop talking. Duplex townhome or apartment setting from metering each individual unit. How can we encourage each unit to be metered and charged separately so that we can um, support water conservation efforts? So no, it, it doesn't. It doesn't restrict metering individual units. Um, we do not want to have individual renters as our customers. We want to have property owners as our customers because if they don't pay the water bill, we want to lean the property, right. um, not um, chase people who are renters. So we want to have one owner who's responsible. If the owner wishes to have, and or if we're required to at some future point in time, required to have each individual unit metered, um, that can be done off the one service to that property or to that owner. And it's not, I mean, you couldn't meter each property and just bill, meter each unit and just bill per property. Um, we could, but we do not, we do not do that right now. I mean, it would require yeah. an infrastructure addition. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you could, but that's however many additional bills, however many additional meters, longer to read the meter. And so um, 
you know, the, we do allow people to sub, you know, like Guilford was talking about, you can sub meter your tenants if you want to pass the bill on to them. That's that's legally allowed by the state, but the town doesn't do that. The owner can do that to their tenants. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, so similarly, sorry, continuing this, this area, the, the town is considering promoting infill as a mechanism to increase affordable housing. I can imagine a case where a homeowner constructs a rental unit on their property and wants to have a separate water service to that unit. It might require two water service pipes and curb stops for the same lot. I understand you can separate the metering. Would it require two service pipes or would you just split it and meter it differently? Um, what, what we tend to do is if a property can be subdivided, we require two services and two meters. Um, if a property cannot be subdivided, we'll allow them to have one service and then they can sub meter inside the property. Okay, thank you. Whew, okay. Um, All right, this part. So um, how does the owner find the curb stop or the curb box if it's, uh, sorry, I'm on page eight, um, page eight, seven C. Mm -hmm. How does the owner find the curb stop or curb box if it's not currently visible? Does the town keep detailed information on locating these, especially in older homes? And then another commenter wrote, I, I swear these weren't all me, I promise. Uh, another commenter wrote, I have no idea where these are on my property. I doubt if many property owners have this information, particularly if the house is old. Yes, most people don't know where it is. <laughs> so how do they find it? So they can log on to, if you go to the town GIS system, then any information that the town has for records of where service lines are and where curb boxes are is on there. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and use this as an opportunity to stand on my soapbox and say, the fact that there's not great records of these is part of what makes me nervous about the town taking on any ownership because this is your house and you don't even know where it is and you're trying to pass a, this unknown information along to the town to, to know where that is. And it's, it's, it's a little intimidating to us. So um, what do you think is the best mechanism for getting that data? So well, if people go to the town GIS system. Sorry, sorry. Um, I mean, if it's not in the GIS system, like if, if, if I don't know where it is and you don't know where it is, now what? Then we have to do some, some surveying and figure out what's going on. It can be a, a detailed process, but it and is it, possible to figure it out. Do that? Well, no, normally the town will try to figure out where your curb stop or curb box is. Your curb, your, your curb stop is going to be at the main and your curb box will be somewhere on your property or adjacent to the property line. So we we can figure it out, it just takes time to do it. Andy? So when you um, are in a situation where you feel you have to shut off service to a property, how do you go about, where do you turn it off? Where, where, where's the valve that you use for that purpose and how do you find it? That, that's the curb box valve. Um, and if we have the information Amy was talking about, we use those records to find it. If we don't, then it's a bunch of, we do a bunch of sleuthing and de detailed figuring out. It takes a while to figure it out, but we'll, we usually figure it out. A lot of times when we actually can't find them easily, it's actually because it's under a tree or a large hedge or something like that. And we can't locate it easily. Or someone paved over it because their driveway is in a different place than it was however many years ago. Um, and it does say that the owner pays all the costs to find it. So would that be if you're doing, I'm sorry, this dog is losing her ever loving mind. If the town is doing the work, they would then send a bill to the owner? That is our proposal right now, yes. Okay. Any, no, no questions on that, okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on. We're good if I move on? Continue the, sh the journey here. All right, so a couple questions hey, about- Anna, Oh, yeah, sorry, one. So a lot of these things that are coming up, which none of us know about, and I'm assuming most residents don't know about, 
I mean, in the lease, should we make a list of them to let people know that these are things you as a homeowner should know about? And because if this happens, then this, this you know, like what, what, what could happen? And I think it's an opportunity to inform homeowners. So at least I want to go and look up now where is my curb box. I don't even know what it is, but I'm going to start looking for it. So I don't know if we should just make a list of it. When you say we, who do you mean? Uh, I would say the town staff, right? I mean, I will include it in my newsletter for sure, but that's a good question. Who should, I mean, I think the town staff, like, could we have this in the website or... I think we can certainly work with you guys on creating something if we know, you know, we want to get information in people's hands. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Dorothy or Shalini, are you all? Was that your? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I think I, I like that, that we do both. Like it's on the town website somewhere related to this, but then it's passed on to us counselors so we can then share it with, with, the, with the residents. Yeah, I could see it as like, Hey, welcome to Amherst. You just bought a house here. Here's the, like, yeah, yeah. Um, Dorothy. So um, my question is, does it have to do with the age of the house or the neighborhood? Uh, when I had my incident, the town knew exactly where everything was. There was no question. They had their ways of finding out and they said, oh no, we've got it. Um, but I'm, a, I'm on a main well-traveled road, but I would imagine some of the more rural or outskirty or older residences might present more problems. So I'm asking, is that true? Yeah, most, most of the time it is true that it's the older houses and uh, older houses on small, smaller roads. Um, yeah. Although there are some newer developments where things were done and there's a time period in our records where records weren't kept very well about 20, 20 to 25 years ago. Um, those records are not the greatest either. So it's, it's both. Okay. So I'll chime in to just say that when it comes to understanding where water services are, I would say that the town probably has 80 to 90% of the water service cards. Then again, if somebody that might be an original, and if somebody did a repair on their property and didn't submit paperwork, we they might not 100% be accurate, but we probably have 80 to 90% of them. When it comes to the sewer service cards, it's a really small percentage that the town actually has in their records. It's, you know, it's maybe on the order of like 20% that we have. So um, just kind of understanding that our records are only as good as the people submitting the information to the town. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in these regulations that's going to improve that? That's uh, get you more records looking forward. Well, it's, it's records have been getting better, have been getting better and better as we've been going along. Um, most of the contractors that work in town who are regulars know they're supposed to talk to us and they do talk to us because we hold the information and then when they have a problem they usually come to us asking for the same information so mm -hmm. they're really good what we find is people who bring a contractor in from outside of town who doesn't work in Amherst regularly those are the people and those are the properties we have the less, least amount of information on because that contractor just comes in does the job and leaves and doesn't really want to doesn't have a relationship with us. Right. Okay. I'm picturing like a sticker that you put on these things. That's like, hey, welcome. You just found the curb valve. Call the town of Amherst. All right, Andy. Yeah, no, I just was just going to point out, if I understand it, uh, the whole process correctly, and I think I do, that a lot of most of this that we're uh, putting into the regulations is really in place already either from the old, very old regulations or common practice or state law. And what we're really doing is improving knowledge by posting these regulations. And uh, so to the extent that we're using terminology or things for the people really need to investigate, it's not, you know, it's, it's that we're alerting them to what really has been all along and that it's a benefit of the regulations that we've been alerted to it and are able to start thinking about what we need to tell the customers. I agree. And it sounds like there's been challenges with not having a lot of this data. And so I just was, this is an opportune time. If there is a way to improve that system to get more data, 
now would be the time to, to maybe do it. Um, but I recognize that there isn't a perfect way to do that. Right. I, I agree. Yeah. Shalini? Yeah. And was there another question around that uh, clarification of uh, damage caused by who? There was, it was that same question yeah. of due process. So, um, uh -huh. yep, I, I didn't flag it because the due process oh, yeah. ones pop up a lot, but I'm happy that okay. we can talk about that. So, yeah, the question is, you know, does it matter who causes the damage to the curb stop or the curb box? Don't normally, forget. normally the damage is usually caused by the property owner. Um, any damage that's caused and we're, we're working on a road is fixed by our contractor immediately. Mm -hmm. So this is damage that usually happens by something being done by the owner on the property. Okay. We can we can change that and clarify it if you mm -hmm. want some more. Yeah, um, I think just clarifying that here would be good. Thank you, Shani. Uh, so, oh, this dog, all right. Um, the water, hang on, stand by. Oh yes, this one, okay. So we're on, now we are on page nine, uh, D up at the top. <clears throat> Leaking service. When the utility determines that an owner's water service is leaking, the owner shall hire a private contractor, obtain a water repair permit from the utility, and facilitate the repairs within seven working days unless an alternative repair schedule is presented by the owner and approved by the utility. Seven days is very short, uh, given like right now, when you think about how long it takes to get someone to come do work on a property. And so there are a lot of couple comments. Uh, my own included this time about if whether that's a reasonable amount of time or is this alternative repair schedule really just going to say they said they couldn't get here for six months. I, that might be real ridiculous, but seven it's, days. And I'm, the I'm seven sure. days is to get people to come talk to us. Mm -hmm. it, okay. it also the seven days comes from um, on the state level. Basically, we're allowed to have 10 percent of our water use that doesn't pass through a meter. And if you're any more than 10% of your water that doesn't pass through a meter, you get in trouble with the state. So we have to have these really strict regulations. And what they say is, if there's like a water main break that happens and it's repaired within seven days, you can say, okay, I'm estimating this water usage. It didn't go through a meter, but we know that there's this water usage. If once it's over seven days, they say that's a leak, you should have fixed it faster. You can't count that. And so that starts eating into the 10% that the state allows us before we get in trouble. Um, so, so the seven days isn't arbitrary. It's a state imposed deadline that we're doing what we can to try to meet. The schedule, yeah. the alternative repair schedule is understanding that getting a contractor there isn't, um, isn't a quick process. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Amy. Um, I guess my question is obtain, right? Like does obtain mean that it is, they've, they're ready to do the work or is it just that they like Guilford said they came and talked to you and tried to figure out the schedule like can they can they get a water repair permit if the work won't be done within seven days yes you can get a permit whenever you can get a permit then or you can wait and get the permit after we agree on the alternative repair schedule but we want people to come in and start talking to us and be as quick as they can about it like Amy says we do have the seven days but the seven days is to get people to come in really and start talking we've had people who have waited months and years before they've come in and talked to us and it's not been a good situation. Okay, Dorothy? Um, how do people know that they have a leak that's more than 10%? Well, the 10% doesn't apply to the homeowner. 10% applies to the utility. But most homeowners know they have a leak because all of a sudden their yard has a wet spot. Or that's usually how they find it. We find some leaks because every two to three years we go through and do, do a leak detection test, and we may find it doing the, doing the leak detection, and we may tell you, we think we have you have a leak there, and it's on your side, of, it's on your service. Um, those are things that, those are the two ways you'll find out. Thank you. The, the regulation says when the utility determines that the owner's okay. water service is leaking, so you would be notifying the owner and once you notify the owner, then the owner has seven days to either hire a contractor 
or come in with an alternative schedule, but the notification uh, starts with, with um, us as a town identifying that there's a uh, leak and that it needs to be addressed. And I think that the notification process can be a little as detailed as you need to be to tell them what to do, but it isn't on the um, homeowner to just out of the blue say, oh, there's an underground leak somewhere and I don't, that I never knew existed. And now you're telling me about it. I thought it was just wet ground for whatever reason. <coughs> Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah, the wet spot in the yard could be there for a while, but until you all say there's a leak here, or until they ask you, hey, I think this is leaking, that that's what starts the clock. Yeah. Okay. Um quick, this is a quick one that I do want to entertain. So uh why a licensed is it just because only plumbers can deal with water meters? Um the question was why a licensed plumber when everywhere else is a licensed contractor? or an approved contractor uh, on page something. So all the meters are installed inside your house and this building code says a licensed plumber is the only one allowed to work inside your house. Um, and actually the licensed plumber can only work, has to in your house and 10 feet beyond and then the contractor picks up 10 feet beyond your house to the main. So. Got it. It's the state requirement. Perfect. Um, all right, couple issues with at the bottom of page nine with uh, 2B. So um, I, I, I enjoyed reading this one. Uh, accessible, I'm, I know you don't mean ADA accessible, but uh, accessible means a lot of different things. Clean is also, as my parents constantly remind me, a relative term. Um, same with warm. Dry feels pretty clear, but these are all really relative terms. And so I think there was a lot of question on who, you know, what does that mean? Um, and then the other question was, again, easily accessed by a person in an upright position, like that depends on how tall they are. So how do you make sure that you're not <laughs> setting people up for, for failure? And then I believe one of the other, one of the other questions was um, the, do, 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 do. Oh yeah, so this person wrote, my meter is approximately two feet above the floor, which would require a person of average height to bend over to install the meter. Are they supposed to then move it and get a whole new one because it's two feet off the floor? No, if it's accessible and a person of average height can kneel down and get to it, then it's fine. But so if the person has to- Upright position, Gilbert. It does, but I mean, the person has to, I mean, we can we can look at changing the upright position possibly. I mean, we what we don't want is someone laying on their stomach or on their back and having to yeah. go upside down or bend over backwards. Those are the ones we want to. I think we also. I mean, and I'll tell you, these are from true stories. We don't I'm want them sure. to have to be moving every single thing in your basement to I'm get at the meter absolutely. to access it. We don't want them to be crawling through a crawl space to get to it. That's, right. you know, it's just, it's not fair to our employees and, and they've been in those situations, um, but it's kind of gross. <laughs> I'm or sure. it's, it's putting a lot of work on them to clean out someone's basement just to access a meter sometimes. That's not part of the job, huh? Yeah, no, I think um, I, I think the spirit of this is clear. I think where the confusion is, is like, all right, if if I can't help some of these, some of these things you can help, but like people have unheated basements, they can't necessarily, you know, I think that the, the question comes in, like, what do they do if they feel like they can't meet these? Or if they are like, oh, well, I can't call them now because it's not, it's a two feet off the floor, right? And I need to move it. So, so I, I guess that, as much specificity would be helpful. Um, I mean, even if you write like meets OSHA regulations for temperature or something like that, where there's a there's some sort of thing that people can meet. This was it was flagged by everybody that that did review this, um, just as a like I don't know what this means. Um, so yeah, we can change warm like, place to above freezing. Great. I mean, I think like the more yeah, the more specificity, the better. Um, and I do think the upright position thing. As someone with a five foot basement, I'm just, I, that, that ping a little red flag for me. Cause I can't, 
unless I get a really big shovel. I uh, can't change that. So, um, and it does, I guess, I'll just, I'll yeah. just throw out with that, that like, I mean, you guys verbally heard us talk about like, here's the constraints and here's what we don't want to see. And so certainly like, if you guys have suggestions on how to clean this language up that gets that intent and makes it clear, I'm, I'm happy to hear that as well. I will happily come to you with solutions and not just problems. Thank you. That's not a problem. <laughs> Dorothy. Um, I think I remember having to have some kind of meter moved in a very, very old house because it was in a very bizarre place. Um, does this happen often that people in very old houses um, do consult with you and get them and move one of these meters? Um, every once in a while we do move meters and people do ask to, and people ask us to, and we ask them to move meters and usually it's to get it into a better position so everybody can see it and find it or to move it away from something that, um, they want to put a bathroom in the basement or they want to do, finish a room in a basement and we'll move the meter. Let's say you can move the meter over here and stuff. We, so we do done. want the meter usually as close to the entrance to the building as possible so no one can like add another line and pipe off a pipe that's before the meter we don't we don't want that that makes mm -hmm. sense yeah okay. um moving on to page 10 number four meter reading and meter reading devices um there's a question about equity of quarterly billing so uh if it's uh maybe the, the first question is why quarterly versus monthly um and if customers could do like an estimated and then a truing up billing if they we're, we're I mean, kind of we're trying to move and we probably be required to move to a monthly billing process um and then what will probably happen because it costs so much to do quarterly billing is it'll probably be something for people who pay their bills online it's something we're looking at we haven't got to yet and we haven't got the ability to do it but we are working towards moving more towards a monthly bill Amy? I, I'll, I'll just, again, you're giving me all the opportunities to stand on a soapbox. I'll just say that in order for us to get to monthly billing, um, it's, it's much easier when we get the radio read meters in there. So anybody who does not have a radio read meter, we would love the opportunity to come to your house and change that meter out because it's, it's much less time consuming to read those. And so we can get billing done more expeditiously. Is that free? It is free. It right. is free. And, and did you look at the people in this group and are ready to call us out if we don't have one? I, I did not. I'm not trying to <laughs> publicly right. shame, but I will encourage each of you I, if you have not changed your meter to call us and we will change it for free. We'd love to. Probably going to have to call you. All right. So, um, and, and you do have it as all meters will be equipped by with a radio read device by January 1st, 2023. So my question on that is that's a deadline you all are prepared and able to meet. For the number no. that that's that's a deadline we put in there. We'll never we'll never meet that because we're not getting enough response back from the residents. If you wanted to change it, if, if we want to change it to a different date, twenty twenty five, we we could do something date. like that. What? That's a big. Sorry, that's a big. That's a that's a big change. Like two. Um, we. To tell the truth, people just don't want people in their basement. And they don't like change. Um, that meters the last couple of years. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Dorothy. Oh, sorry, Amy. Did you? Oh, I'd assume that a radio reading did not require them to come into your house. It does not, but you have to go into the house to replace the meter and put the radio with the meter. Well, I I think this is something that's just ready for a big campaign. Um, so I would say, let's not change the date. Let's just get people going and let them know that, that uh, one free visit in the house and then it's contactless. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, Amy, I hope there's enough room on that soapbox for Dorothy to jump up there with you. I love it. No, Dorothy, this is awesome. Let's, let's team up. Okay, Andy. great. <laughs> Can we take Andy. bets? <laughs> Andy, what's your question? Yeah, no, it isn't really a question. It's just the point that I, I think that a lot of people at this point, if they were just told that, hey, you don't yet have a radio read device and you're required to obtain one, please give us a call. At least it gives people a chance. But if there's confusion now as to where they exist and where they don't exist, 
I mean, I think I have one, but I can't be certain because I know that you that a, uh, a change was made. But I, I thought the change was made to put it on the outside of the house at one point. That was that was the previous iteration, so we didn't have to come into the basement. We could read it from the outside, um, which was better. Over time, those wires corrode or get snagged on something, and it's why the radio that's right next to the meter means that we also don't have to enter your house, but it's um, a lot less um, ripe for an error over time. Um, is yeah, we've made a couple. We've made a couple pushes, and we will make more pushes to try and get in people's houses. Recently, we've been targeting anybody that had an estimated read, so the people who we can't get a reading from. Um, but over the past, we've been at this for like eight years now, trying to change them out. And so we put stickies on anybody's um, utility bill that didn't have it, or highlighted on your, your utility bill. Call us. We want to change your meter. Um, we sent out mailers. Um, we, we've, we've tried a lot of different tacks, but we're certainly open open to suggestions and, and even just circling back to the, the tacks that we tried initially to try to push this forward. Shalami? Uh, yeah, again, um, how, how, do we, how do we know whether we have the radio? Is it, are you still highlighting it in, on the website? I mean, on our bill or? You could also, if you go into your basement, if you know where your water meter is, which Hopefully you do. Um, it should be somewhere in your basement, usually on the street side of the house. Okay. If you go along that wall, you should see yeah, where it yeah, comes okay. in. Uh -huh. um, and if you look at your water meter, if it's got a radio, then you've got the meter head that you can read a number on. And then it's got this, um, is it gray or black? It's basically got a box. Black. That's, it's black. So a black device that's attached to the side of it. Um, if it's got wires going out to okay. wherever, that means that you've got that technology that Andy was talking about, which is a read it, reader on the outside of the house. Okay. But if it's got this box about, you know, mm -hmm. yay big, that's okay. attached to the side, okay. that's the radio. Okay. Was there a particular year when all of this changed? Like, can I just send a blast out message that if your house was made before so-and-so year? It's not about know? when it was made, but we yeah. started changing out these meters in, I want to say it was around 2014 was maybe when we started. Oh, and nice. so if you had your meter changed after 2014, then you probably have a radio read. Okay. If it was prior mm -hmm. to that, Thank then it you. would have been previous technology. Thank you. Um, and, and my question was less about are the residents of Amherst ready and more are more you all have enough radio read devices, you all have enough stuff that if we if every single person was magically like I'm ready tomorrow, you could get them done by 2023. No. Okay, so the state definitely does need to change then. Yes. Um, okay, great. Thank you. That's good note. Um, we have enough meters. It's the man. It's the manpower. It's to, the staffing. Yeah, absolutely. It's the staffing time yeah. time frame to do it. But yep. the the meters are sitting in boxes as they have been for several years now. <laughs> right. And every every two weeks that it takes us longer to to do this, and I apologize. Uh, that's two weeks less that you'd have to do it. So, um, yeah. So I guess that would be. I, I will let you all determine. Guilford, you said twenty twenty five. Is that the the pitch? I'll let you no, all figure just, that out. But you can do that for now. All right. 2025. Okay. All right. Um, so then next question is uh, some landlord, this was, okay, let me, sorry, I'm rereading this for the, for the second time today. So, Cause you can see when I put it in, some landlords uh, might not opt for a radio read device as written. The regulations would likely pass the cost of non, oh, it's another due process question. So um, I don't necessarily know that that's on you all to respond to about how to prevent them from passing that on to their tenants. Why would people choose to not go with a radio read? Is it just that they don't want people in the basement? Amy? Well, no. we really don't want to talk about all the reasons. Oh, there no. are a lot. There, there are people that have a fear of um, radio signals. Um, okay. Is it e EMFs or whatever? Um, okay. They have a fear of that. And so we do hear that from time to time. Um, we have literature on it that, you know, that we can show you that it's, 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 it's actually not, it's not as harm. It's not harmful. It's not scary. It's, I mean, we're carrying cell phones. We've got TVs, we've got microwaves in our house. Um, your, your radio device on your, and your, and your electrical meter probably has the same device that we're going to try to put on. So we're not yeah, exposing you. But I understand the fear, and we do have to talk people through that fear from time to time. 
from time to time though, this is not a significant thing. No, it's, it's a small handful of people that, um, that have that question and we, we talk them through it. Most people, we can talk them all the way through. And some, there's some people that regardless of what we say, they're, they still, that fear is there. Okay. Thank you. Dorothy. So my question is, does this radio meter emit a signal all the time or does it lie dormant until you send a little, hello, hello, I'm here to get you so that it actually is on it, a very, it, re time. it remains dormant until the reader comes by and says, Hey, meters talk to me. And all the meters talk to them. And then they yeah. go dormant again. All right. So that's not much radio waves. That's what I'm right. saying. No. I'll, okay. I'll also point out, because some people also have the fear that when they hear it's a, you know, a smart meter, they have this fear that someone can watch what they're doing all the time and will know when they're on vacation because we can see that there's no water being used for a week and that sort of thing. Um, that's another fear that comes up. And I will say that we, in order to do that, you have to have technology, you basically have to have antennas throughout the town that are reading that all the time and sending it back to us. We do not have the technology to do that. Um, and so again, that that fear, people hear smart meters and they they go to a dark place. We don't have the technology in place to, to do that, nor do we have plans to set up technology like that to know your reading on a daily basis, to know when you're in town or not in town or what you're doing at your house. Um. Thank you. Sorry, I'm trying not to go scroll as fast as I normally scroll, but it's a little really hard. I hope everybody's having a lovely Thursday. Uh, we talked about lawn irrigation systems. I'm just gonna make sure I covered everything with it. Um, oh, so one of the questions was you talked about, the, you used the word permitted. Oh, sorry, I'm on page. 15, you use the word permitted um, for regarding municipal, I mean, regarding lawn irrigation systems that are connected. And it was just, do you have that form and can you put it in the appendices? Yes, that's something we're moving towards. That's why it's in there now. Awesome. So we can, we can come up with the, it basically would be the same, it would be the same application you use now. It would just be for a lawn irrigation system. Perfect. Um, and then second point is, is there a deadline for this similar to the radio um, meters? Uh, at what point do all irrigation systems have to comply instead of just new ones? Or is it only new ones? We would prefer, well, we're going to, we're probably going to be required by DEP to know all our lawn irrigation systems. Okay. Um, because that's part of the drought management plan they want us to have is that we won't know where they are. Um, so uh, it's coming. So it's not anything that's actually probably right now, but it will be coming that we have to know all this stuff and we'll have to actually permit them all and actually verify they have the proper backflows on them and inspect them according to the backflow devices as well. So it's, it's something that's coming. So you're not able to put a deadline now, but we should expect a revision in the future where you add one. Yes, although if you just leave it like that, you kind of cover the future. The, the big thing on this as well, you know, thinking of what the DEP is going to be requiring us in the future is also that moisture meter. They want to make sure that you're not watering the lawn when it's raining outside. And so any new lawn irrigation system, this is standard practice now, but they're going to expect all lawn irrigations to not be watering on a rainy day. Okay. So I think, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Guilford, to your earlier point though, I mean, I think that's been a, that was a point of confusion throughout this is what's retroactive and what's um, just for new. And so I do think that if something is retroactive, it's it's helpful to explicitly state that. Um, and, and I know you can't give a deadline, but you can say all new and existing, right? Or something like that. Um, because for a lot of the rest of it, if I'm not mistaken, no, maybe I am mistaken, right? Like, I, I, I guess I just, one of the questions that came up again and again was, is it retroactive or is it just new? So you're saying that assume retroactive unless otherwise specified? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dorothy? Um, <clears throat> I find it interesting to know when these things are DEP regulations. And um, the, so I, I think you, I would suggest putting that in. Um, also, I, do you ever get money from the government? Um, this sounds like this would cost money to do. 
Um, we, ha we actually have to pay the Department of Environmental Protection about $18,000 a year just to operate our water system. So no, we do not get money from the glorious state to help us with these things. Thank you. The DEP is pretty famous for what we call unfunded mandates, which yeah. is we're going to require you to do something that costs money, but there's no funding, unfortunately, to cover that cost. Yep. I mean, they're actually also talking about manually or automatically controlled valves on sprinkler systems that the utility can actually shut off during a water drought, that we will push a button and a signal will go to your house and shut off your irrigation system. But I don't know how they're going to do that. That's going to drive some people nuts, but it's a good idea. We are nowhere near the technology to do that for anybody that's fearful hearing that statement. And you definitely would never just do it for fun of like on, off, on, off. All right. Um, <laughs> well, only to it you. Depends on who you are. I was going to say, this is why I don't have one of those and why I'm not a, a util water utility person. All right. So um, too much power, too much power. Um, Okay, so we are now on page 19. Um, how do people get as built drawings? Um, the owner or contractor or its contract, its contractor, these are humans or their contractor, um, shall provide as built drawings to the utility at the completion of the construction project. So Maybe. as built means the new thing that they just put in, not the, the as built when the house was built. Correct. They actually make the drawings as they, it's either in the, in the new plans for the renovation or so forth, or the new house, or they give us a sketch of what they actually installed. And, and the contractors know this pretty much. Perfect. When I read it out loud, it made sense to me. I don't, I think it was not my comment, but it makes sense. All right. Thank you. That, that's also a place where, as we were talking about service cards and having them or not having them, that's the requirement that says at least from here on out, whenever anyone's doing work, they need to submit that so that we have those records. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, almost there. There's one big one. Um, okay. So maybe two big ones. Um, we are now, oh my gosh, we are not, we're almost there. We're now on page something, 22. Mm -hmm. And we're starting with four water use restrictions. Um, so this was the this was the question that I'm hoping my fellow counselors will have some really good insights on and, and their thoughts. So who is the proper ent entity to impose water use restrictions? The council or the DPW? What so this, what, hang on. What Sorry. This, no, it's okay. Um, what this is saying is that the council is giving, just clarifying what what as oh, I understand okay. it, this is saying the council is giving that permission to DPW. And the question is, as water, as acting as water commissioners, should that be the council or should it be DPW? Right? Guilford, that's the question as you were, you can, you can go now. I'm done. <laughs> so there's actually two levels of water use restrictions and there's restrictions that we put in place, um, that we put in place, which are kind of informal restrictions. Um, as we move into our new water permit, we'll actually have a more formalized and it'll become part of this, I hope, um, water use restriction plan and policy. And that actually kind of falls to, would fall to the water commissioners during certain events that are declared by the DEP that you, you would have to do those. So is this a change? in whose responsibility it is? No, it's no change. I mean, right now we just, right now we don't, are not required to have a real formal policy. It's coming in our new water permit. Um, so we work on, on an informal policy, which we can do some restrictions, like I said, um, but then when we go out to the community and do community wide restrictions, those have to come from the water commissioners. Andy? Yeah, I was just trying to think back. I can only remember one instance when I was on the select board where this came up. I was uh, trying to remember the exact year, but it would have been and obviously within the last 10. And you came to the select board and, you know. Yes. I mean, that during, during 2016, that was the year of the drought, Amy? Yeah, I yeah. think so. 
that was we had to go to the select board for that but then we had a water break when two years ago we had a water break and we put out a notice immediately saying we need people to conserve water and please not waste water so that's one of the ones we would do on a temporary basis or as needed basis for a, a dedicated incident and then the water restrictions which um, Andy's talking about was for a longer uh, DEP required, you need to do this. So, so is it temporary or is it emergency? Because um, they're both. Yeah. Okay. I mean, perhaps this gets split into if it's an emergency, then the utility isn't going to have the time to get hundred percent town council approval for these, yeah. you know, short ones that maybe last 24 hours or I don't know, maybe less than five days where some, you know, some incident happens, you know, certainly the town council is going to be involved in the process. If, you know, something like 2016, where we've got a drought, we're yeah. watching water levels drop and we need to do a long-term several months. Um, yeah. And our new, yeah. some of it though, also our new, as Guilford's saying, our new water permit which we'll be getting one of these years, but our new water permit is literally going to look at river levels and say when you're river, either based on calendar dates, you have to do water use restrictions between this date and this date, or once a river level drops to this certain amount, you have to declare a water. So some of it's going to be taken out of our hands, regardless of what we want to do in town council. It's just going to be permit based. So, so it gets a little more complicated in the future. And yeah. as I recall that drought, um, it was really a statewide crisis and it didn't hit us first, it hit other parts of the state. And so other communities were in the news a lot for water restriction and, but we came into it eventually ourselves. Correct. Dorothy? Um, I am getting curious about the, the new water permit. It sounds like something that's um, very much based on mandates that's going to be many, many, many pages that you don't know if you'll get it and you don't know when you'll get it. Could you expand on that, please? Well, we, we know we're getting it. It's, oh, um, it's kind of like we're going to get a tax bill this year. We are eventually going to get a water permit. Um, yes, we don't know when we are going to get it. The, the issuance of the permits have been delayed. Um, they were supposed to been issued back in- I think 20... 2015 or 16 is yeah. when our previous permit expired. And, but the entire state, all 351 communities all expired at the same time. And because of all these mandates, it's taking longer. So they're literally going river basin by river basin and we're low enough on the list. It was supposed to be 2018 and that was 2020. And here we are in 2022 and they haven't gotten to our basin yet. Um, so we don't know. So this is not in your control whatsoever? No, None we whatsoever. submitted the paperwork many, many years ago um, to be in compliance. Thank you. Yep. So I'm curious how Chalini and Dorothy and, and Andy, do you feel in this situation that it's helpful to define temporary in, in the way that we've defined temporary in other situations, like temporary use of the common and things like that, or short, we, that's short term. But do you think that, are you all comfortable with this as written, or do you feel like it should be a time restriction or a classification restriction, like emergency, non-emergency or what I'm, I, for me, I guess I completely agree that in instances like, you know, something broke and we're off doing whatever we do in our, in our time. Yeah. You all should have that call. You're the experts on this and droughts are not going to get less common. Um, and so, you know, I think it makes sense to, to consider what it means to be temporary versus what it means to be a community wide, uh, community wide conservation of water. Dorothy, any thoughts? Yes, I don't think it's going to be as simple as use of the um, public way. No, I, I was. I, I would not want to define this thing uh, clearly. Um, I would want to include something that says that we expect DPW to let us know what's happening and that when appropriate, the town council will um, vote on it. But I, I really want to keep it very loose. I want them to be able to do the right thing at the right time without having to wait for a meeting. 
Okay. So then Dorothy, how do you, how do you determine when it's appropriate? Like, do we have a meeting and we vote? Cause then well, we'd be approving. Well, they, so, I have to, I, when it comes to water, I have to put my faith in the DPW. So, so then we, well, we are not experts on water. I fully agree with you. So oh, my I, question, I would put, we would, they would inform us of, um, changes in regulations and water use or restrictions as, as appropriate and the town council um, after the fact. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you want to leave this as is? Yes. So I'd love to hear Paul's comment on it. Uh, okay. Uh, let's hear from Guilford first because he has his hand up and then Paul can think of a comment, his comments. Guilford? Um, actually, so as we talk it through, I mean, we wrote this because we do this all the time and you guys brought up some valid points. So let us play around and let us write it a little better and be a little more clear on what we're gonna do and we'll give it that language to you. How's that? That sounds great, I appreciate it. I, where my mind was going, Dorothy, just to, just to clarify what I'm thinking about when I think of temporary. So when I was on conservation commission, we would um, issue emergency certifications, right? Where work had to be done in an area because it was an emergency. Um, and yeah, we probably would have permitted it if we had known that that, you know, dam was going to break or whatever. Um, and they came to us after the fact. And so I think that there's, there's elements here that might be worth exploring, right? Like after the fact, they go to the commissioners or, in, in, or they in, at least inform them, um, the water commissioners, or, you know, I, I can see it in emergency cases and we know droughts are going to be long and we know that they're going to come up more often. And so I, I can also see our constituents and our residents wanting to understand why these things are happening. And if we don't know that they're happening or why they're happening, um, we can't necessarily advocate for them. So I, I think that there is a little bit of a balance and I fully agree with you that these folks are the experts and, and they should have the bigger, the much bigger say in the matter. I think it's an interesting point you brought up that they, whatever is here should match or relate to some of the language and uh, procedures for the conservation committee it's a that's a to i keep giving really bad examples that is really different because those are like really official permits and and, and stuff but um yes i yeah thank you guilford that sounds great paul yeah and, and i think the goal on this is to avoid conflict and, and create clarity and i think if you say you know if there's an emergency you know the, the utility the, the management has to be able to say there's a fire we have to shut it tell everybody to shut down or there's a major water main break um but if it's a five day or more you might i mean that's what guilford will think about in terms of if there's something in state law or something or state regulations we can tie it to then it's more of a public relations thing as much as saying the public knows that we're asking for this and you have said yes we need to do it and we've justified it so i yeah. think differentiating a little bit makes sense but also so that it's clear so when there is because these are these are going to be dramatic situations when they happen we want to be clear about who has the authority to do it we don't want there to be conflict about who gets to say it when there's a difference of opinion right absolutely yeah thank you moving down uh to five no oh, no six c six a letters are hard um $10,000 a day of such a violation. Uh -huh. So a couple of people flagged this partially because two of us believed that MGL limited us to $300 a day um, and for, for non-criminal violations. And so we wanted to check that. Um, the, other, the other person was like $10,000 a day, oh my God. So uh, can you explain why $10,000 a day? Can you confirm that that is not in violation with the non-criminal non um, statutes of MGL and well we've been we've been trying to we've been trying to confirm it we haven't confirmed it yet um just so you do know the fine for the water utility if we do something the DEP would fine us twenty four thousand dollars a day is the minimum fine they have and they have the right to suspend to cut that in half by fifty percent so yes but you are there is there, there is the possibility there is a possibility someone in the utility could cause a fine for the utility by doing something they're not supposed to do and, and give us a fine of $12,000 a day. Um, I'm very sorry that that happens to you. And uh, it would be great that if we could confirm that it is not um, a violation of that non-criminal non -criminal penalty. Um, so I will uh, eagerly await your answer. 
Um, <laughs> and then the last, uh, I think, I think this is the last thing. Uh, going way down to the appendices, we are on agricultural use. Um, so a couple of things, um, small thing, wait, hang on. Uh, is the requirement that the owner, oh, so let me clarify. This is not only for land in APR, correct? This is for any land that's being used as agricultural, regardless of whether it's in APR or not. Whether no, the way it's... The, the way it's written, they're supposed to be an APR. It's supposed to be an APR. Is that too restrictive is the question. Um, In your opinion, is it, I mean, that's an opinion. Question. I mean, I'll, I'll say that these regs were voted on by the, I guess it, maybe it was the select board at the time, but were voted on by the select board to, to give an allowance for at least the agricultural. And we were trying to draw a very clear line between somebody having a garden and watering their lawn versus um, true agricultural use. So a farm. So I thought we said it was either APR or zone. Um, yeah, 61A. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So, land. yeah. So, right. Yep. So for folks, it's down below. It's right here yeah. in definitions. Yep. So the question, I guess, okay, never mind. Andy, what's your question first? No, it's a question, it's a comment that I was on the select board then. So I, when we created this policy, I think it's important to note that it really arose because um, people who were in agriculture uh, didn't like the idea that they were being paid to pay for the water, uh, for the sewer portion of what nor we normally pay for because they were drawing water that was never going to get into a sewer system because it was being used for agricultural purposes. And uh, the uh, whole process was established in, um, to differentiate between what they would use in their homes um, that would be going back into the sewer system because it's, uh, it's no difference from anybody's house and what they're using for agricultural use and uh, that they had to be able to separately meter um, that and they had to do that at their own expense and that was the whole um, structure and why it was set up and uh, we got lobbied fairly hard by people through the agricultural commission to do that change. So, and I, the other thing that I've heard, um, Amy and uh, uh, Guilford can confirm this. And I think I've asked a question before at some meetings is that there's been less use than we anticipated because of the uh, cost of changing out systems um, is not small. Thanks, Andy. I, you're, you're prompting me to ask the question though. Now we have separate water regs and separate sewer regs. Like they are metered differently now. So people who, who aren't agricultural aren't paying necessarily extra because it's going back into the town sewer, right? Like people who, who have town water, but private septic. Um, right. Okay. I'm just making sure I'm comprehending that. Okay. Yes. So, so then the question is, if, if what Andy is saying was the impetus for this, do we still need it? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. I think we have- Why? <laughs> we, have we have like- One, three. I, yeah, I, I think it's maybe three in the past four years that have gone through this process. And um, okay. yeah, I mean, I'll say for the benefit of the town, it also means that these people that are doing agricultural, you really need a backflow prevention device on it. And so that was the give was, you know, we'll make you not pay for sewer, but we're going to put that device on there so that we're getting you into compliance with this other reg that you maybe weren't in the past. And, you know, mm -hmm. for us, that's a great exchange. Yeah, that sounds great. And, and to uh, confirm for the seventh time, other people who aren't necessarily paying for sewer through their water, they're just, they pay for sewer through their sewer. Right. No, all, all the sewer bills are based on your water consumption. Right. Okay. So I don't have sewer, so I'm completely lost. I'm sorry. Um, so you, you don't, since you don't have sewer, you don't, yeah, you don't pay a sewer bill. Yeah, right. Well, hopefully I don't be weird if I did. Um, all right. Um, so, right. And so, okay. So then um, the, the question was, um, 
oh, the uh, agricultural water rate. Is that set when we set the water rates? Andy, was that a conversation with finance? And how often do we revisit that? So that's part one. And then second, if you're trying to move to monthly with everybody else, do you want to move agricultural to monthly too? Or because it's agriculture and their use is more seasonal, keep it quarterly? I don't know the answer some... to your second. You know the answer to the second one, but not the first one? No, I don't know the answer to the oh, second okay. one. Either. Uh, currently, you know, right now, the water the water rate and the agricultural rate are one and the same. We wrote it this way just to uh, give an allowance for if they wanted to have, if you guys wanted to set a different rate for agricultural rate, um, which like say the town of Hadley has a separate charge for agricultural rate versus um, household usage. So. so so yeah, and Andy, I'd love to hear from you. I do think that when it's defined as a specific rate that's approved by the water commissioners for approved agricultural water meters. In my mind, it just means we need to make sure that that's clear in the motion that we make when we approve our rates. And Andy, I guess that's my question for you and finances. Is that explicitly stated that it is both the water rate and the agricultural water rate? At this point, I don't think that the uh, annual orders say that. They just say we set the water rate at it's assumed to include all because I think as uh, was just indicated, there is no current differentiation of rates. Um, you know, we may have to do, you know, we probably could do that in the next round of orders, uh, though I think we have one already on the agenda for Monday. Yeah, you do. I mean, is it unnecessarily complicated? I'm trying to figure out if I'm making it unnecessarily more complicated or if I'm clarifying for people and I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. If we, if we separated it out. I, I don't think you need, yeah, I don't think you need a separate action because okay. the water rate is the water rate unless you define something different. But it is defined differently. Like it has its own definition as its own rate. So I feel like we could add something that's like the agricultural rate is the water rate unless determined otherwise. Like there's nothing that, there's no so, way that I would know what the rate is. I was just gonna say, if you look, if you scroll back up to appendix A, that's where we have the rate and fee schedule. And our intention was that's the one page that on an annual basis you change. And there it does list out the domestic water rate versus the agricultural right. water rate. And they're the same now, but that's yeah. when you, right now, when you say water rate, you're changing both of them without distinguishing one or the other, but that's, that's where it gives you the opportunity to have different rates if you want. Okay. So, so like my small stickler side is still thinking though, that when finance sets water rates and approves them, it, it, it says it, water rate, it says it water says, rates, right? It's the okay. global, that that's what you're setting. All right, okie dokie. Um, I think that was it, everybody. That was, I think, all of my highlights. Thank so you. So I will, I will send this to you right now. And I am. Oh, the only. Yeah, no. I'll send this to you right this second. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen unless anybody has any last comments to make about water. Uh, just to ask a question. So you have, there's a lot of other comments in there other than the ones you highlight and you did a terrific job of walking everybody through the bigger uh, questions. Mm -hmm. what, what is your intention with this document now? I'm happy to send it out to everybody. Um, I didn't want to do that because we hadn't put it in the packet. So I'm happy to, to send this document to Athena to, or to send it to everyone and not get comments back in a group discussion. What, what do you want staff to do with it? Oh, I was going to send this to to um, Amy and Guilford. There are some of these that are small changes. There are some that that are, I think, quick answers. So I would love to hear their responses to it, um, whether that's in writing or in person. In writing is actually easier. Um, it for it per, like that would be my preference. So they don't have to come walk us through the that in a meeting. So What's do you want to do you want to take the the, doc, the track changes document that you have and add comments? Do you want us to take yeah. it and revise it and come back with a clean document? And uh, I would like to send the track changes and they're not necessarily, there's like small editing changes. There's not any substantive edits. There's, there's just questions. Um, and so the questions might lead to edits, but we need their, res their responses first. So you want them to work from this document, add their comments onto the track changes document. 
with, with the comment sections, right? And then send it back to you. Okay. That was my thought. Does anyone else want to see it done differently? Amy and Guilford, does that work? Great. I'm also going to send you the sewer regs in advance so that you can um, make comments on those as well. Uh, and that way we can look at your comments fresh. And I do truly apologize that I didn't get that for you this time. Uh, Dorothy? Um, I would suggest that um, Guilford and Amy um, dev devise some shorthand uh, for some of the answers such as, thanks for the clarification, uh, not applicable, uh, leave it as it is, um, or, or whatever, because uh, just to keep the job from being too onerous. Having been in many meetings with Guilford in the past year, I am confident that he will tell me very clearly if I should know the answer or if he's already answered it. Guilford, I, I say that with care. I don't say that as a bad thing at all. But yes, I appreciate Thank you. That. Um, yeah, please, please let us know if you're like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, all right. I'm turning it back over to Dorothy, unless anyone else has anything else to say about water regs. And thank you all for, for going through them. Um, and thanks to folks who sent me, sent me comments. Yeah, Shani. And the other thing is the list that we can get as a form of education, like about the radio thing and the other thing that we want residents to look out. If you can give us a list of that, then we can yeah we can make you we can use that to share forward and my question was yeah oh, i was just gonna say until we approve these i wouldn't have them do the list like yeah whichever we... order i don't care what when and what but just in terms of your to-do list if, if that's uh, if you could add that um the other question was when do we discuss the the ray the who pays the repairs question Um, I don't know. I, I guess I thought we would get to it, but I, I think we're not. And I think that Anna brought up a lot of interesting points on that. And we have to do that on the sewer regs as well. Um, we don't have a bunch of people waiting to talk, comment um, in the audience. Um, so I would suggest that we um, then do the, at the next meeting, do the sewer regulations and then have our discussion because the after we've gone through the whole thing, because we're learning, we're learning things that I think it will inform our decision on that. At least I have. I've learned some things today which uh, are, are important, and then have that dis discussion. Um, com committee members or anyone, you can weigh in on this. So I'll jump in. So how do we define it in the water regs? I didn't. Right. So it's it's we in must the water. address it. It's. It's in here in a couple spots, um, Guilford and Amy. I don't know if you have any, if you can point me to a specific spot where we were talking about responsibility. Um, let me, I can try to find it. Hang on. It's under the service section. Thank you. Because it's going to apply to both water and sewer. Yep. Um, so if you if you look at the document, um, what would be helpful, I think, is if we could come up with. Um, what language we would recommend that they they do put in or um, can you I, share that section i'm trying to find it sorry okay um Gilford, what did you just say two seconds ago that i was looking for it's in the services look under water service thank you thank you, thank you. okay water service my re recollection from the finance committee that the um, calculations that we made were from the water main to the property line. And that um, that was the only, that was the part that we were thinking was most likely to be shifted because the cost is so uncertain and variable from the property line to the, to the interior of the house. It depends upon the landscaping. There was a whole lot of factors that was put into the finance committee report that Mm -hmm. addressed all of the problems if you were to do that both financial and as far as applicability how to even determine applicability and i think that the largest objections that we were hearing uh, as a council were from people who felt that it was unfair to 
pay for things that really were in the street. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So to be clear, this isn't, it wouldn't be a separate conversation or a separate vote. It would be, we, we changed this section, right. Of the water regs. Um, and so if, if folks would like to go through the water regs and send me proposed language, that'd be really helpful. Um, or any other comments that you have on this, on this section, that'd can, be great. Can, yeah, Paul. So, so I would suggest, I, I think what I'm hearing from counselors is that they want to say the line should be at the property line for maintenance, right? That's what I've heard from several counselors. Um, so maybe you can ask uh, Amy and Guilford to suggest language that would accommodate that, and then they can you can look at that side by side. Um, I think there's some concern about when that gets implemented um, because we don't have a budget to do that. But it'll be a good. We should know what that the council should see what that language looks like. Yes, I actually had the discussion about that today as finance committee chair uh, because of the fact that we've already proposed rates um, for FY23 beginning July 1 and it is, that are on the agenda from Monday. And so we can't really charge the extra amount that would have to be charged to cover the uh, fund paying that expense. So I think that it would have to be uh, for uh, something that would be implemented effective at the beginning of FY24, which that would be July 1 of 23. Okay, so let me add another note that says plus deadline, Shalini. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been discussed so far about that. Uh, my question was about some of the people, and this is not retrospective, right? So some of the people who are who've already incurred damages or are currently undergoing that, is there any way to support them? Oh. Uh, as a practical matter, and speaking again from the Finance Committee discussion of it, mm -hmm. um, it would seem that the answer is no, because if you start doing that, then you're putting the, uh, the burden goes on to the enterprise fund, but the enterprise fund hasn't calculated rates that would pay for that. So it would um, end up causing um, a deficit in the enterprise fund. And uh, I'm not sure that that's something that uh, we'd be ready to recommend. I mean, I can go back to the finance committee to talk about that, but I, I think that's what the reservation is. Yeah, I just have a follow-up question. No, I completely understand that, Andy. And is do we have any space any place any funds for seniors or i don't know are there any other miscellaneous sources not for everyone but just people of limited income or sen seniors with limited income the town doesn't but there are there may be programs out there for uh -huh. people who are truly limited income who might qualify um I can, we can talk to the senior center. Um, they would probably be required income documentation, mm -hmm. but I don't but, know if it's retrospective again. Right, but even if you could offer that as resources to people that can, hey, we're going to- I can to ask do. Haley about that, yeah. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. Dorothy? Um, I, is there a possibility of, if there is a fine, um, of something that we would, in our future revised regulations, uh, would, they would not have incurred. Uh, and they don't pay the fine, but that the town puts a lien on the house so that that is paid when the house is sold. Is that a possibility? Do you do business like that? That's, that's mostly how most of the unpaid water bills are uh, handled is if you don't pay your water bill, it gets, uh, eventually it gets leaned on your property. Because that would be one way somebody could deal with this if they don't have the money for it, which, you know, a large mm -hmm. sum of money to do it. Okay. All right, great. So just to confirm, um, we've gotten a lot of the answers here. I'm going to send this along. I'll take out my highlights because they mean nothing. And then um, that's probably the most significant con substantive change. All the other ones are more clarification. Um, 
and things like that, other than what we've discussed. Um, all right, great. So I think I think we're ready to wrap up. I'm 10 so, minutes before I want it to be. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Gilford. Um, so water, the water and sewer regulations are very similar. So when you send us the water ones, we'll look through that and then go back to the sewer ones and take some of the comments you've made and assume those will be probably the same comments you'll make on the sewer ones and make those changes as well, if that's okay. That sounds great. There's only a couple of differences. I think you're absolutely right on with that. Okay. Thank you. All right, Dorothy, meeting is yours. Okay, well, it's uh, 25 after eight and we have a few things to do. Um, if I could find the can agenda. Can you offer a public comment? I mean, then not many ah, people. Yes, we could call, here we go, okay. So we will call oh, for public comment. I'm so sorry, comment. Dorothy. I'm so sorry. I meant to say goodbye to Guilford and Amy, and I, I totally forgot. Good. I think we're done with them. Okay. So thank, thank you very you much. So much. Sorry. Yes. For thank, thank you. Thank you. And Bye. thank and thank you to Anna also for putting all of this together and thank making it a much. very entertaining meeting <laughs> about water. <laughs> well, and water and sewer. They're really you know exciting areas, and we've learned a lot. It it has been interesting. Okay, it's like even those finance hearings every Tuesday and Thursday have been actually very interesting. Um, okay, attendees, um, I'm gonna ask attendees uh, if anyone wants to make public comment. If so, please raise your hand and then um, Athena will let you in and, and you'll say your name and address. Okay. Um, I think it's going, going, gone. Okay, so we come back to our meeting and end public comment. Um, do we have a, any appointments filed with the town clerk? I have down solar bylaw working group. Um, yeah, I was gonna suggest we do the solar working group and then we hold the minutes and uh, adjourn because we said we'd try and get out by 8.30 and- That's right. Uh so uh, the names were not added to the agenda, so I'm not sure if the count if the TSO committee can actually act on it. Okay, um, fine. Um, but I mean, it was, the the name was on the, so I'm not sure you can act if you have any questions. So so it will be on the agenda for Monday's meeting, um, but won't be on co the consent but agenda. Didn't, didn't we see them though in some previous document? I I send them to council like I always do, and I look to right. Athena for more guidance on this. So okay. TSO re reviewed and recommended appointments to the Solar Bella Working Group at their previous meeting, and those will be on the council agenda on consent on Monday. And there will also be, because these new set of appointments came in past the 48 hour deadline for this meeting, this set of appointments will be on the agenda with a waiver of council rule 8.6. Thank you very much. Um, and the, the waiver and approval will be on consent. Okay. Sounds great. And we have approval of the minutes of May 19th, 2022. Any comments or questions? Okay, then I'm ready to hear a motion to- I move that we approve the minutes of May 19th. Okay. And do we have okay. a second? Thank you, Anna. All right, all those in favor, um, I will call on you, Shalini. Yes. Um, Anna. Yes. Andy. Yes. And Dorothy's a yes. Okay, so unanimous with one absent. We have approved the minutes. And uh, the only other item, um, I guess it's not on here. Um, agenda preview. Um, I, I did have one, but I don't know what happened to it. Um, I don't see it now. Um, we sh Maybe it's on this report. Okay. Okay, so we do need to look at it. Okay. So next meeting is June 16th. Um, Paul, will we be having the Transportation Advisory Committee charge and roll discussion or will that be coming at a later time? That will be coming at a later time. I met with Tracy Zafian today and uh, it's there's a lot of, there's different versions of the charge and recommendations. So we agreed that she and I would work on it. We would work with Guilford and Chris and then the TAC. And then once we are able to bring something that's more, um, relevant and, and sort of discussable mm -hmm. for, with you, we would bring it to you for your for your review. Okay, great. Okay, so then the other item that was on uh, for June 16th is speed limits. Uh, I will, be re will we be ready to discuss that on the 16th? So I can have a memo to you for that. And, and I think we, we had planned on the first, we can have that, a memo to you um, on what that means basically, yes. Okay. 
And then we had June 30th. And this is going to. And can I just, before you leave the 16th, we're light, let's see, it's the 16th. We're likely to have a, a slew of appointments, mostly reappointments. So you'll have a whole bunch of uh, things like that listed. Okay. Very good. Um, will we be able to talk about community impact assessment on June 30th? And that's something I, I, was, I was in the minutes that we were going to do that. I know Shalini had asked questions. I'm not quite sure what's involved. And, and we had down July 30th town gown relationships. Otherwise, I don't know what else we would be discussing. Yeah, Shalini. Is that the community engagement impact question? What is it? Well, it was uh, my note said community impact assessment. Um, I think this was in our discussion with the CPOs. Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was actually going to ask you if we can put the community engagement because I have some ideas put together from different research I've been doing and in communication with Paul and Brianna. And so maybe, yeah, by then I will have a more formal document that I can send to you as a starting point for a discussion on community engagement for, for from the town council perspective. Like from the committees and town council perspective. Yeah. That would be for June 30th. Okay. I'll put that down. Okay. And Paul, will we have anything concrete to discuss? I mean, we, we all can talk on town gown relationships, but will we have anything concrete or that that you would want us to be discussing on July by July 30th? I don't I can't promise anything by July by June 30th. Um just given where, the pace 30. of things, or July 30th. Yes, yeah, so it was July. These are dates that were in the notes and I, I, you know, I went through everything and found them. Um, oh, July 30th, possibly, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then my next question, and this will be the last, well, the last one to, I'm asking you, is do you see something else that we should be discussing in the upcoming TSO meetings this summer? Or should we reduce the number of meetings that we're having this summer? So I think you could, well, the, the thing that is on my plate is the TAC uh, or Transportation Advisory Committee um, charge. And when I talked with was Tracy and I thought we would be taking, it take a couple months to work it through the sort of TAC and the staff here. So that would happen at the end of the summer, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have other things for TSO at this moment. I'm not sure what could get referred to you though. Okay. Um, Anna. Um, Dorothy, I think you might have had a, a typo. July 30th is a Saturday. So um, I Oh, so you, you think it really was June 30th. It, it, yeah, it, so so I would I would note that you I meant thought of checking that, but I couldn't do it. No, it's it. fine. No worries. I just wanted to make sure that people weren't like planning on that for a certain okay. date. Okay. So we I'm gonna put down I'll just say July. Okay. Just we'll cross off the 30th and say July. We maybe have a chance to do that. Okay. Perfect. And Shalini. I had a question about the in-person meetings after July 15th. Is that also for committee meetings? Yes, unless the legislature passes additional legislation, there is legis they're likely right. to pass something. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. But at this then, moment in time, there isn't law that goes beyond right. July 15th. Right. Okay. And then can I... So, I mean, not suggest, but just alert that they could be a TSO item that might happen if the town council, some of us who are working on zero waste bylaw uh, yeah. on universal composting, if everything is in place, then that might get yeah. referred to TSO after June 30th. Okay. All right. So uh, we, I mean, we could certainly do that as an information session but you think that after june 30th you might have a possibility okay so july might be town and gown might be zero waste um we have a and will we be ready on june 30th which i assume is the right date but i haven't checked it at this moment for the uh community engagement and community impact uh, shalini um do you want to take charge of running that meeting Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Be nice. So that means that if you want us to do anything, you have to send us some emails and ask us to do something ahead of time. Otherwise, we'll just come excited to hear what you have to say. 
um, yeah, I can send the tentative, like a starting place mm -hmm. uh, format or uh, st set of questions and stuff, and then people can go through it, and then it at least provide us something to start the conversation off of and see where it goes. So are community impact and community engagement two separate things, or are they the same thing? I think they're two separate things. Um, what is community impact? I don't know. It was it know. was something that the CFO of officers were talking about, Ooh. and um, I, then there feel? was something about a se series of questions. I mean, I that I think were one of the things. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I oh, please do, please. So do. I think one of the things we were talking about was what a community impact assessment would mean if we applied it to changes that we are making, like bylaws. And so, mm -hmm. what would we need to know? What would we need to ask? That was my understanding of community impact assessment. Um, and that would be something that we would mm -hmm. pitch, I guess, to to the council. That's yeah. I, that's the number. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yes, and we've been sort of doing that in the CRC. I think that's what we call it, community impact. And that would be part of the community engagement, which is that when we're making these bylaw changes or something, then getting a sense of what is the impact going to be on mm -hmm. different aspects of the community so that's one part but then also what is the impact on the you know the economic impact the environmental mm -hmm. impact so you, we're looking at any decision that we're making what is the different impacts on it so i think the community the community engagement thing will cover mm -hmm. at least some of it that because that is part of the question is yeah, okay, I don't want to go into that because right, right, that'll right. be deliberation, um, but yeah. Shalini, I am remembering that in the early CRC, Meg Gage <clears throat> came and made a presentation of a list right. of community impact questions. That yeah. would be every time you do something, you're supposed to say, how does it affect this? How does it yeah, affect that? Yeah, exactly. All the way down. Yeah. And that is connected yeah. to, but separate from community engagement. Right? Yeah, so and I think I'm looking, yeah. And I'm looking at it in a broader way where that right. that will be part of the bigger mm -hmm engagement question okay so that sounds fine and that will be helping us to think through the outreach in tso um shall i adjourn the meeting yeah. or entertain a motion for the meeting yeah. for the meeting to be adjourned who would like yes. to make that motion? yes okay or can i just say the meeting is adjourned meeting is adjourned <laughs> okay thank, thank you, you everyone much. and thank you anna again yes. thank you athena thank you paul Thank you. Yes, good night.